options, volume, dynamics. Joining us now is Chris Preble uh, from Schaefer's Investment Research, and uh, he's on right now. Chris, how's your day going so far? Pretty good, Spencer. How are you today? Doing great, doing great. I see we have your charts. I'm going to bring them up on the screen for us, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll run them for you. And the floor is yours. All right. I, I enjoyed Chris Capri's uh, presentation very much. So you share that with him. Um, my name is Chris Preibel. I am a senior market strategist and quantitative analyst at Schaefer's Investment Research. My presentation today follows up pretty well with the previous Chris's. Uh, I get into option volume dynamics after I follow up on my previous slide, which I did in February. I'm going to highlight a few of those slides and then we'll get into the charts that I have to show you and a um, couple examples and then we'll wrap it up. Actually, Chris, I just want to jump in for a second. You, I, I, I misspoke. You can actually control the slide yourself. If you just click on the little the little arrow, if you like mouse over it, you can you can see there there's a, there should be arrows to to the right and to the left and you can maybe you can control them yourself actually do you see what i'm talking about no i do not if you look even go on the screen like just yeah. just mouse on the screen you should see like a little arrow pop up no you're not seeing when i'm like if you like mouse over like the the, the video player you're not seeing that when i mouse over the the screen I'm on the presentation. Oh, you're only on one screen. On the side, I can see you and myself split. Okay, uh, within the studio, see see where see, do you see how it has your your slides shared like uh, on in the little box? Or no, I don't know how much screen space you have available. I got it full screen now. To full where screen. Okay. Yeah, right, if, the if, banner if, running if, at you the go, if you go full screen, yeah, right, right above the banner. See if you can mouse over that. I don't know if it'll work for you because you're on full screen. It may not. And that, and that, if that's the case, I'll just I'll run the slides for you. Well, when the banner drops, there is a. I don't know if it's stopped though. I don't want to stop it. Oh, Spencer. All right, it, it, it's easier for me to run it. So I'll, I'll just run the slides for you and uh, keep on going. All right, so if you're not familiar with Schaefer's Investment Research, we have been in the option trading business for 41 years. We're celebrating our 40, 41st this year. Schaefer's is known for expectational analysis. What that is, Bernie set this up back then. It's the combination of technical analysis with fundamental analysis, and then we layer in sentiment analysis. We combine the three for the best overall picture of security or an index or sector. Um, Bernie was a pioneer of options trading and has published the Option Advisor newsletter, which pretty much was the first analysis of the options market for the masses, for the mass public. And, uh, one of our latest services here at Schaefer's that I'm excited to promote is the Schaefer's Playbook of the Week. Uh, you'll get this every Monday morning at uh, 8.30 a.m. It's a live trading event to get you geared up for the week. It's a great summation of the weekend news um, and the way we analyze that. You get a quick review of last week's trading activity, highs and lows, examples there, our current market outlook, specific sectors we're watching closely. The presenter, Brian Sapp, he does a good job of, of combining the sentiment and the technical analysis on those charts. Uh, it's a primer for our EA, expectational analysis to uncover the most profitable trades. It's also a deep dive into equity from our watch list for that week. And then there's a QA and a session at all times that so you can type in, uh, ask questions, uh, and then we wrap it up before the market opens so that you're fully prepared. It is a service where we have only a, a set number of subscribers that will allow into it. It is a very exclusive service. Uh, you may enjoy it, you may not, but I have, I'd like to point that out to you. I'm ready for the next one. All right, getting back to last February, mid-February, I presented for Benzinga. And I don't know what happened there, Spencer. I'm on full screen here. Hey, Chris, apologies. Uh, Spencer accidentally uh, removed it. We are getting it back hey, up for you. Sorry about that. I, that, was, hey, that, was, that was user error there. That was user error. 
it's ultimately my fault. So. No, nope, no, nope, it was user error. Give me one second. There we go. Now we're back. If you go back to this one for a second, uh, if you follow the markets this year, um, and if you follow them for half of your life, like I have, you'll see that volatility is ultimately inherent. We went through a stretch two years ago after the COVID pandemic where fiscal and monetary support was flushed into the system. And we almost had like a perfect storm of good news, perfect storm of liquidity. And it pushed assets, asset prices to unsustainable levels. And over the past few years, we've been working off these excesses. Uh, monetary and fiscal policy is tightened. Um, inflation is rampant. And markets by nature being circle, circular in nature, I see cycles everywhere I look on every chart or every uh, inflation gauge. They go up and they go down. This is nothing new. Equities do this. Inflation does this. Uh, seasonal patterns, the tides of the ocean. Fashion industry goes up and has downs. Music industry changes over time, etc. All cycles. Night follows day. Humankind has followed celestial, ob celestial objects and cycles since antiquity, whether to predict rainfall totals, timing of wars, or for financial gains, which leads me to my next slide that I highlighted last time about the eight-year Venus cycle. Now, the eight-year Venus cycle, I didn't properly attribute this last time, Spencer. The eight-year Venus cycle, the first time I picked up on this, I read about it. It was first proposed in 1921 by a Columbia University professor named H.L. Moore. He was the first one that wrote about the Venus cycle. Interestingly, since the last uh, presentation, in 1918, that was the origination of the Red Army in Russia. It was the Venus, Venus year. And here, as you see on this slide, tw 2022 has been a complete disaster from a geopolitical standpoint. 2014, that was the first year that Russia invaded Ukraine, they annex Crimea. Eight years prior to that, Russia blocks gas supplies to Ukraine. You see the pattern here. Eight years prior to that was the Russian default on their debt. Uh, they had to devalue their currency, which caused the hedge fund long-term capital management to blow up. Eight years prior to that, you see the point here. Iraq evades the Kuwait, U.S. in the recession. 82, Ozzy bit the head off of a live bat on stage. That is obviously crazy. Uh, U.S. was in recession. The 10-year note was at 15% in 1982. So if you think 3% th now is is bad, I mean, double that, triple that by five, and you'll get the 15%. And then 74 was the year that we were in recession, and Nixon resigned. So why am I bringing up this geopolitical past? I wanted to get you, if you go to the next slide here, Spencer, I wanted to give you a grasp of where we were at that time. This was mid-February. Uh, we were at 438 on the SPY. As you can see from the calculation there, we were about 15% above that blue line, which is the 500-day moving average. If you go on to the next slide, this is where we are now. That blue line is the same 500-day. That's about 400 on the SPY. We are... we've. We've broken that level. Uh, we have seen rallies like Chris Capri talked about lately. Um, but honestly, those are more short covering rallies, in my opinion, because when I go to my monitor list of the stocks that are up for that day, they all have high short interest. So it's more short covering. You're not seeing underlying strength. In fact, you're seeing more technical weakness, as we saw Walmart and Target get obliterated this week. The purple line on that screen is another one of my favorite long-term indicators. It's the 1,000 day or the 200 week. That is about 14% where we are now. So if we fell another 14% on the spot, we would finally reach that long-term support level that was broken in the COVID crash, but then quickly retraced. And as you see there in 2018, as the trade war rumbled on with Trump and China, we actually went down and touched that 1,000 day. So to see this amount, this gap between where we are and long-term support, it is worrisome. 
to me, especially in a midterm election year, especially with inflation running rampant, and especially with no resolution on the Ukraine and Russia situation. I hear people get on the television left and right, and they say, oh, well, you, you got to do this. Or you got to wait for that. If you do not have clarity on the Russian-Ukraine situation, you will not get clarity on the inflation front. Because right now, Putin has his pedal on the gas pedal, and he is pushing energy prices any which way he wants. There is really nothing we can do because the United States has lost the ability to be a shale oil producer through regulations and pipeline shutdowns, et cetera. We cannot pump oil as fast as we could. So I don't think we're going to get a, a drop in inflation until you get a drop in the Ukraine-Russia situation. I don't think the dollar is going to weaken until that happens. You've seen the flood into the dollar late. The dollar is the safe haven. Uh, people say, where do you, you know, where do you go with your money right now? Obviously, your people are going to cash. The United States dollar is at multi-year highs, and it honestly does not look like it's going to stop with the Fed tightening quicker than other central banks. All right, I'm going to get a drink. Can you go to the next slide there, Spencer? Everyone has probably seen this table or this graphic. I look at it as a cycle. It's investor psychology, the ups and the downs. A couple years back, we were at this point right here. It says thrill and euphoria. Everyone was making money on SPAC stocks, meme stocks. The only people that weren't making money was short sellers and anyone that was short the market because there was so much cash in the system. We were flooded with liquidity and everyone was trying to put it into the market because they were at home or are not working as much and it was a form of gambling. Well, that form of gambling has turned its ugly head. And I would describe us in the investor psychology uh, timeline here is the denial or fear or desperation phase. I would not say that we have had a panic or a capitulatory moment in the market. I know it has steadily gone down, but we have not had any real washout days. Uh, despondency. As you can see from the chart, though, this is the maximum point of financial opportunity is when prices are reduced as they are. If you go to the next slide there, Spencer, please. I appreciate it. This is a financial article from this week. Uh, hedge funds scale back bets on U.S. stocks as losses surge. The market continues to teeter between complete apathy and bewilderment. Ron Adler, who works at JP Morgan's trading desk, wrote to clients, while flows haven't quite been capitulatory yet, we have begun to see some of the more prominent growth players on the long only and hedge fund side start to finally unwind some of these positions, which fits in well to that investor psychology graphic I showed previously. On the next slide, I bring up something called the supermarket analogy. Pardon me for a second. My mouth is very dry here. The supermarket analogy to me is when you see a discount for something you like, oftentimes you run out and stock up on it as if it's the best thing out there because the price used to be 100 and they're offering it for 70% or 75%. You're giving you 25% off. How can you miss out on this deal? I looked in on Google just out of curiosity. I already knew the answer. It was more of a rhetorical question. Do consumers like discounts? A slight discount, even a slight discount, can change a buyer's attitude towards risky purchase. A recent study from Retail Me Not found that 80% of shoppers said they feel encouraged to make a first-time purchase with a brand that is new to them if they found an offer or discount. So four out of every five people like a discount. I don't know about the one out of five that don't like a discount. They must really have a lot of money to spend. The point of this slide, people like discounts. But if you go on to the next slide here, Spencer, I found a little uh, interesting tidbit. Pensions and investments article from May 3rd, two weeks ago. 
U.S. listed ETF snap record inflows streak. So you're meaning to tell me that as the market fell this year, people started to get scared and they pulled their money out of the stock market? Now, the slides that we just went through suggest that the maximum point of financial gain is when the market is in a fearful stage, when it is washed out. So why people would withdraw money after the market went down and not have the fortitude or the knowledge that it will go back up. It is a cycle. You actually want to take your cash, if you have any disposable cash, and put it into the market right now. Come back to me in three or six months after we get some midterm election information, after we get some resolution on Ukraine war, and tell me if it was a good decision or not. not and you won't because I know I'll be right. It just is going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to happen over the next two weeks. It may not happen over the next month or two, but three, six, 12 months out, you are, those investments you make now will pay off. Thank you, Spencer, for your patience on my slides. I'm ready for the next one there. So let's get into this option volume dynamics. We at Schaefer's were blessed. We have a, a lot of data sources. One of my favorites is the combination of three different option exchanges. We get buy to open and sell to open data on different baskets, security size, whether they're large or small, and what type of client it is. We combine those together in, into one uh, indicator for different sorts of stocks or equities. Um, the three exchanges are the MISE, the NASDAQ OMX, and the, the Philly exchange, PHLX. On this screen here, I detailed since the beginning of 2020, the top line, the top light blue line is the S&P 500 of SPY. The bottom line is retail option volume. Actually, this is going back to 2016. So you can see a steady increase but nothing really dramatic until you get into about 2019 there's that first blip then it comes down 2020 you can see the covid bottom and then as the government flooded everyone's accounts with money people started trading options at a very healthy clip uh, since the middle at uh, the beginning of 2021 we have seen a decline in option volume from that peak. Now, these are buy to open, equity only, daily call volume plotted over time. And as you can see, any real spikes in call volume, call buying, it's more indicative of the, uh, the euphoria in the market. When you got a lot of people rushing to buy calls, you really need to scratch your head and say, uh, is this a top or why are they buying so many calls? Because from the point of maximum financial gain, you, you kind of want a situation where people are rushing to buy puts, not calls. If you go to the next slide, I have a ratio. Again, this is the S&P on the one. And then the, the ratio that spikes up to the right, it's a put call ratio, a 10-day put call ratio volume on all optionable stocks. So we got like 3,200 tickers here. And as you can see from this chart, that put to call volume ratio has not taken out the 2020 COVID highs. It has not taken out the 2008 trade war highs. So what I'm trying to tell you is as bad as it's been this year, we have not seen a flush out from the option volume marketplace that would in my opinion be that capitulatory moment where you can say all clear now we don't have any resolution on the ukraine situation either so i can understand why we haven't had the flush out yet there are a lot of people that are still trying to pick bottoms i track weekly open interest changes here at schaefer's using some data from trade alert and I've, it's struck me as odd that over the weekly time frame, you will have more SPY and QQQ call ads than you will have put ads. 
that's highly unusual when the market's tanking. You really don't get a lot of bottom picking when the market's tanking. You get the flush. You need the flush before we stop going, start going up. And I know the price action today. I don't know how much the Dow is down right now. It was down 750 points, erasing Monday and Tuesday's gains. Um, so that's exemplary of what I'm talking about here. We still have not had that flush out. I'm ready for the next one there, Spence. And this chart, it's, it's the, the orange line is the S&P 500 components. Every, every one of the stocks that trades equity, we combined all that data into one indicator. It's a 10 day buy to open, a put to call ratio. The blue line is the S&P 500. As you can see here on the S&P 500 stocks, cumulatively, we have not taken out that COVID extreme. However, the reading that you see on the far right is, is pretty elevated. Uh, short covering rallies would not be surprising considering the, the breadth of this, how put heavy we have become, how, you know, it's still not over the top, but as you can see from the, the troughs in this, in this ratio in the orange line, think of the troughs as when the market was call heavy on these S and P stocks. And as you see, it's not perfectly consistent, but those troughs, over time have marked peaks in the market. It's something we look at here at Schaefer's, you know, whether people are being put heavy, call heavy, to what extent and how is price action doing amidst that trading activity. On the next slide here, I believe I have the NDX, which is the NASDAQ 100 components, their buy to open put call ratio. And as you can see, that ratio has in fact taken out the COVID lows. This makes me more constructive on large cap tech. Uh, their earnings are solid. They have enormous amounts of cash on the balance sheets. They refinance their debts when interest rates were low. So they're not prone to these interest rate hikes as some other companies could be. Uh, so you can see people flocking to puts on those NASDAQ 100 stocks. Uh, there's two ways to look at a flood, at a, at a run of puts on an equity or on an index. A lot of hedge funds like to be hedged, hence their name. So they'll buy stocks and then hedge with puts. So you do see increases in the put to call volume ratio at times by hedge funds. And it suggests to us that maybe they're accumulating shares uh, but you're really you're, you're just not seeing it in the price action yet, but it is evident from this chart. Same deal with with lows in this indicator. It's a it would be call heavy. So we're, we're definitely not on a low on this indicator, which does make me feel better. However, like I said in previous slides, we haven't had that that flush yet. I'm ready for the next one. This same concept as the previous two slides, except I use the Russell 2000, the IWM. I combined all the optionable tickers with the help of my colleague, Rocky White, here in our QA department at Schaefer's. He's very helpful with the coding. We combined all the optionable IWM stocks, and this is what the ratio in the orange looks like for the small caps. And the blue line is the IWM. You haven't had a flush in the small caps, uh, nothing near the 2020 flush or even previously to that, the uh, trade war. Uh, my takeaway from this is that inflationary concerns are probably going to hurt small caps more so. Uh, in addition to that, small caps are more sensitive to the increases in the interest rates. They may not have refinanced. They may not have the cash balance sheets that large corporations have. So I believe there's some worry that as inflation continues to tick higher, small caps are more vulnerable. Um, I'm gonna get a drink here, Spencer. I, I'm ready for the next slide. This particular slide is just one individual equity. It's AstraZeneca, same concept of the 10 day volume put to call ratio. 
you'll see on AstraZeneca, which is a large uh, pharma company, that there's the bottom bottom pane is spikes in the put to call ratio. And you'll see at that March 2020 spike, obviously the market bottomed out there. So AZN went up afterwards. But there have been other spikes where you've seen an increased interest in put buying. And that has marked a low in the stock. And just recently, I took this data in the technical and fundamental sentiment backdrop in AstraZeneca. And I opened up a long position in our weekend trader product. Um, I like AstraZeneca here, despite the market's hiccups. Uh, you've got various indicators suggesting it's a good time to buy. So I wanted to lay that out there. I know you like picks, Spencer. Uh, there's one one for me right now. I believe the the next chart. How are we looking at on time? Next chart is the second largest market cap company co corporation in the world. Saudi Aramco recently overtook Apple Computer. But I wanted to de detail what this 10-day put-to-call ratio looks like on a large company like Apple. And then follow up and show, you know, times when there's a rush to puts. Seems to be the time when Apple bottoms out little capitulatory moment where the ratio is pretty high on Apple right now. Um, it goes back to the previous slide on large cap tech um, being more supportive than the small caps. And again, you can see lows in this ratio or times that call buyers were very active. Uh, it marked short term tops or uh, periods when Apple didn't advance as rapidly as when this put to call ratio was high. So I wanted to point out to the listeners a couple of the indicators that Schaefer's has here and the way we apply it to price action, provide some details. On this next slide, one of my favorites, uh, recently I wrote up an article for the Schaefer's uh, chart of the week. And we looked at the market value changes of the top five corporations in America at the beginning of the year, there were five corporations that had a trillion dollar market value or greater. Those being Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. Actually, it was, I believe Tesla was one of them. I may have that missed correctly on the chart. Uh, the, oh, I see what's going on here. This is the put to call ratio on the big five. Uh, as you can see, there was a large spike of late almost to the 1.10 reading, which is one put bought to open per every one call. Uh, these five stocks this year, if you combine their market cap, at December 31st, 2021, their combined market cap was over $10 trillion. Recently, I found that they've lost $2.5 trillion this year, 25% of their value combined. So their market value is now only $7.5 trillion. I find that from a round number level, peaking at 10 trillion and then pulling back to 7.5 trillion being very interesting. Uh, we'll see if that holds, but uh, it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, let's see what's on the, the next one here. Looks like I'm out of time. Uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening. I hope you learned a lot. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out um, either at me on Twitter or via email. Uh, Schaefer's Research is a great source for option trading, ideas, analysis, uh, content, commentary. We also have real-time trading services, uh, play different strategies, whether it's volatility. Uh, we trade straddles. We trade strangles. We have premium selling services. So check us out on Schaefer's Research, and uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up there.